Well, as was already stated, Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers and the mother hearts. I just love that, mother hearts. I guess because I don't have children and I know I've been probably a mother to some and probably a pain to others, but it's just um, the idea of mother hearts just feels good to me. So, and um, since my mother is no longer here in a particular plane, although she still is in other ways for me today. So, you know, it's interesting. I still find myself, I don't know what it is, but this is the third month I'm in the Gospel of John. I mean, I happen to like John. I just don't know why I'm still in John so much. However, you know, I've been following the lectionary, and this is the one they gave me today for, for this particular Sunday. And it's an interesting one. So a woman has already told me in here, who, who, someone I'm very fond of, Actually, I'm going to just tell her name. Mary already told me how she felt about some things. So I'm just going to let you all know you're going to have to bear with me today on this one. But this particular pericope or this, this particular cluster of scripture um, speaks to my heart in many ways. And um, yes, we're still in John. And unlike the other gospels, unlike Matthew, unlike Luke, unlike Mark, who deal with the birth and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, John tends to perceive and focus more on the divinity of Jesus. In fact, so much so that there are scholars that feel like he's redacted or made a lot of changes in this gospel. And some of them even think of him as a docetist, which I think is a little stretch, but you know, saying that he doesn't even think that God was human, Jesus was human. Never mind, we're not getting into all of those things today. However, there are a few pieces that I do want to talk about from this scripture. And this, if you get a chance, it's a very rich uh, cluster, as Barbara said, it is a prayer of Jesus to God. And it has a lot of different pieces in it that you might want to unpack at another time. So in this particular scripture, we find that Jesus had been speak, has been spending time with the disciples. It is considered a, um, what you call, it is the day before he's going to be arrested. So in many ways, it's, and we know what the rest of that is. We just came from that period, the arrest, the crucifixion, the, uh, the resurrection. So it's his last day with the disciples, if you will, before life changes really quickly and horrifically, and then things happen divinely. Right. So he's talking to the disciples, and then he now goes into a prayer. And by the way, when he's talking to the disciples, he's kind of telling them what to expect, that life is gonna change and he's not gonna be here with them in a particular form, but, but the advocate, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, God is gonna send down to be with them and, and make things clearer to them, to the disciples. Some of them understand him, some of them don't know what he's talking about. Yet he's trying to talk to them and explain what's about to happen. And then, he goes into this prayer to Jesus, I mean to God. And this prayer is considered what they, they call it a high priestly prayer because they, it's considered a heartfelt cry from Jesus to God for the disciples. Actually for not only the current disciples, but for the ones that's gonna come later. And in many ways, it's an intercessory prayer. Some of us know about that. Um, intercessory prayer is when you get up and pray for other people. I remember in the year of 2000, the 21st century, I remember my niece getting up in her church praying for me. Because at that time, I, uh, the first eight months or so of 2000, I didn't walk or talk. And so my niece got up in her church to pray for her aunt. And what was interesting about it, her husband was, well, let me leave him out of that. He had a particular way of thinking about me being same gender loving, yet his wife, the first lady, my niece, got up in his church to say, I'm praying for my aunt, because my aunt needs my help right now, prayer, because she can't talk right this minute. 
and she's not able to walk at this moment. So, so anyway, I know about intercessory. But here's Jesus praying to God. And now, and then consider this a high priestly prayer because it's about an outcry. And it's also somewhat simple yet complex because there's so many components to this prayer, I think. So we're going to I'm only going to talk about three of them. So we have Jesus the night before he's arrested praying to God for his disciples. And apparently we get from this that Jesus is praying for them is asking God, you know, he's praying to God about the disciples because he cares for the disciples. He loves them. And he understands that they have been with him throughout most of his ministry. They have seen a lot of his ministry, a lot of his miracles. They've seen him do things in many ways. They see him, they saw him break the law. He was talking. He was eating with people that folks in the law back in that time was telling you, no, you don't sit with folks that have an illness. You don't sit with people that maybe had more than one husband or maybe considered bad. You don't talk to women you don't know. So they was with Jesus and they saw him break several laws. They also saw him show love to everybody. And, and so he's praying to God for his disciples because he loves them. Yet he wanted to make sure, by praying to God, Jesus wanted to make sure that the disciples continued to be protected, continued to get the care and the support that they needed. He was letting God know, listen, I'm not gonna be able to be with them any longer, yet I'm praying to you. I'm not gonna be able to be with them like I was in the past because in the past, as Barbara read, Jesus was saying, I used to protect them. It was me that had that responsibility. Now, God, I'm turning it over to you. Because in actuality, you gave them to me anyway. These are your people, which is another interesting statement. So Jesus turns to God. He turns to rely on God to uh, be with the disciples. Now, I have to say, I found this to be extremely interesting to me because Apparently, even Jesus, with all of his spiritual abilities, needed God to intervene for him. Now, Jesus, up until this point, when most of us knew, we've had stories, I just said a few, we know about him doing things, raising people, so the Bible tells us, Scripture tells us, raising people up from the dead, making things happen, making ways out of no way. In many ways, Jesus showed us his skill set. He was accomplished in his ministry, so it seemed. He was smart and even competent, and yet, with all of his competency, with all of his skill set, with all the miracles he performed, there was a time, there came that time that he needed God to intervene for him. That even he, the smart man, the leader, the rabbi, needed to turn to God for help. And I found that to be extremely interesting. Because to me, I thought God, Jesus was modeling for us for some of us in this room, or maybe all of us in this room, that even if you are competent in your job, and you know you're smart, you've made, you've got a lot of abilities, you've accomplished a lot, like Jesus accomplished a lot, yet there may come a time that you have to rely on something or some entity other than you for assistance, as Jesus did. That it may come a time that all of your leadership skills and all of your, your lawyer rights and all of what you have done in the world may not be enough right now. And that it's okay to ask God for help. That it's okay to pray for people you may not be able to help right now. I have nieces and nephews up in Ithaca. Today is Mother's Day. That My sister's gone. They're up there by themselves. I feel all kind of ways about that. The family is in New York. They're up there. Who's with her children? And then I realized, well, you know what? I have to turn that over to God because I cannot fix that. I got to thank God that 
the God that's with me here in New York City will be with my sister's two children as they celebrate the second Mother's Day without their mother, my niece and nephews. So I think that God is letting us know that a compliment, that it's okay to be like Jesus, accomplished. And yet know that, you know what? I'm going to turn to a power that I know. Because apparently Jesus trusted God with his disciples. He knew he was leaving. And nowhere in the Bible, in any of those gospels, did they tell us that as he was getting ready for what was to happen next, that he lost all of his power. We understand he was resurrected. We understand he was telling people, um, robbers and criminals, you will be with me. Yet, before he even got to that point, he prayed to God for help. So, to me, it's a message that God is that Jesus gave us. You can be a powerful person. You can tackle many projects. Yet, at times, there may come across situations in which you need to seek some sort of assistance. That's divine without losing your credibility, if you choose to, or your ability to lead. That seeking God out is not a bad thing. And I, I, I marvel at this, that Jesus is saying, Lord, I'm turning my people over to you. I'm trusting you to do for them what I was doing, but I can't do it any longer. So I'm, 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 I have faith that you will do that. Now, there's something else in this pericope that's going on. In the pericope, Jesus asked God to protect the disciples because he was leaving them in a world that they were not, they were in the world, but not of the world. And that the last line of, my, of that scripture piece says, Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. And now for the dictionaries have different definitions of sanctify. In this sense, sanctify means to set apart, just to set apart. So what are the truths of God that we believe in here at Judson? I mean, Jesus tells God, you know what? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. What are the truths of God that we believe here? Well, the first truth I believe that we are believers of is that we recognize that God is actually about love and that love is for all people, which includes us loving ourselves first. Well, actually, the scripture is loving God and loving yourself as you love your neighbors. But that's what it says. We believe that to be a truth of God, that God is about love and love for all people. We also believe that God's house as a truth of God, is to welcome all people to God's house, regardless of their spiritual or religious background, their socioeconomic level, whether they're black, white, Asian, Latin, heterosexual, LGBT, LGBTQ. We believe that. Whether they believe in, whether they're atheists or not, whether they come in here for community solely, or come into Judson for social justice solely. They're welcome here. We believe that to be a word of truth. We recognize how important that is for people, not to be concerned with what they're wearing when they walk in the door, how they may or may not have an odor because they've been homeless, whether or not you know who they sleep with, how they, rec how, they, how they are identified. I often watch people when they come in here. I'm reminded when one of my first or my early times here in 2013, I remember the Joy and Concerns, uh, was it Joy and Concerns? No. Yes, it was. It was Joy and Concerns. And I watched the people online and I watched a man who was white with a woman who was white come up and ask for concerns. Then I watched another couple who was also two white men that were in a couple and they asked for love prayers for their, for their families. Then I, asked, I saw an African-American person come up with an Asian person and they came up and talked about their families for prayer. And I said to myself, now look at this. That is a word, that's the truth of God. 
that at the end of the day, there is only one silo, and that silo is people. And all of us are God's people. The rest of it is the way how we identify, how you can discern Michael from me, Micah from me. I got longer hair than he does. That's how you discern us. And he's just a tad taller than me. I'm lying there, he's a lot taller than me, but anyway. But you know, the rest of us identify. Yet at the end of the day, the, the truths of God that we believe here is that everybody's welcome before we attach a judgment to them. And so another truth here is that we know that God is available and God of, of blesses different ways of interpreting theology. Whether you're coming from a, uh, like James Cone, a black theologian lens, or you're coming from a Dolores Williams, a, um, a womanist theology lens, or you're coming from um, the, the lens of liberation theology as Gustavo did, liber um, Gutierrez, or you're coming from queer theology or feminist theology, or as a former community minister, Kendrick Kemp informed us several years ago, he let us know that God can be found in black liberation theology of disability, of recognizing that it's all God's. And then another truth that we have here at Judson is that we recognize the truth that we have a responsibility to our earth. The earth is important to God as well. That's why Michael went into all of that statement, you know, about how we want to put things that we are going to recycle where we put them and, and be really intentional about that. Because that's the truth that we believe. And so sometimes, even in the scripture, Jesus is saying to God, you know the people are gonna be hated in this world because a lot of other places don't think the way we do. Some people wanna say that we're not even a real church because we're not putting anybody out. That we stand up for social justice. That we believe it's morally wrong to break up families when somebody has already did the time for what they did some 40 years ago. That it's okay to bring a woman here who doesn't want to go back to a country that wants to mutilate her children. See, um, some other churches, God bless them, they, they do it a different way. And so they want to say that Judson's not real because we, everybody's okay to come in. And I'm saying that we're, Judson is completely finished. We know that's not real. No one is. None of us are. Yet at the end of the day, we recognize some truths of God that allow us to have, which is a segue into my next piece the third one in this scripture, it allows us to have a little joy, a little peace. Because that's also found in the prayer. God, Jesus asked God to make sure the disciples have God's joy in them. How do you get the joy? How do we get the joy? Perhaps we get it by being able to understand that we, it's okay to have concern for others because as you have care for other people, that brings you joy. Perhaps we know we can get joy by um, uh, being in community on Judson on Sundays or um, uh, coming in and helping out with, with the, uh, the coffee hour, greeting people, saying hello to folks that come in. I was standing in the back and Matthew came up to me. He noticed there were two people I was talking to. He immediately introduced himself. There's joy in being able to do that. Being able to make people feel welcome here. Perhaps we get joy in recognizing that it's okay to have time to talk to God, which is a form of prayer, which can bring us peace and joy. And then perhaps we get joy by recognizing that as human beings, we were going to make mistakes. And our humanness does not stop God from loving us or from throwing us out of God's family. And uh, since this is Mother's Day, I want to tell a little story about my own mother as it relates to her life and her connection to God and her ability to have joy. So my mom was married twice. Um, 
she was born in 1924. She got married at the age of 16, and um, she make it 1940, I guess. And then um, she had my sister in 1942. That didn't work out that well, that marriage. Um, this was in Norfolk, Virginia. However, in 1948, my mother came to New York without my sister. And she remained, my sister remained in Norfolk with my aunt, who had six other children. No, eight. Six boys, two girls. And my mother, my, my sister remained in Norfolk with my, our aunt and her father's family from the age of six to 11. That's, that's when I was born, that's when my sister came up to New York. Now, I'm not, you know, you can imagine what all of that must mean to, and we can talk another time of what that can do to people, to children separated like that. However, you can also imagine back in that time, and maybe even still today, mothers don't get an opportunity to do things like that much, to say, I'm not gonna be with my child. Usually the world tries to make you feel bad, make you feel like you're less than mom, you're not a good mom, or stuff like that. But here's what happened. In, in, um, my mother was a praying woman and a believer in God in some kind of way. I don't know how she did it, but in some kind of way, she, she must have believed God had forgiven her. She must have believed that her mistakes as a woman, as a mother, and as a person did not stop her from living her life. And I say this because for years, I used to think, oh, by the way, after she married, I mean, divorced my sister's father. She married my father, and I will just say one sentence on that. She came from the frying pan into the fire. Those of you who go back long enough know what that means, because he was abusive to her. And so the first 10 years, she had that kind of existence. But here's what happened after that. She found a connection to God. In some kind of way, she recognized that God had forgiven her humanness or her imperfections. And I say, well, you may say, well, Valerie, how do you feel that? Why do you think that? Because any time I had a problem before 2008 when she died, any time I had a problem or all the time I was sick when I was having a pity party and I was feeling like, why am I sick? Why me? What the heck did I do? I was about losing my mind. So, well, you know what? Let me call Ma. Because she always got a prayer for me. She always got a word of encouragement. That's what, and, and I had friends that say, Valerie, you need to call your mother because we need some assistance of an uplifting way of thinking. And that's, that, and it came to me after she passed that I got it. She connected to a God that forgave you. Some kind of way, regardless of what the world may want to say about her, and whatever her reasons, I, we never know, because she done went on to glory, and my older sister, whatever she knows, she's not telling. So, uh, she can't talk to her about nothing. Yet my mother was connected, she believed that her mistakes didn't stop God from loving her. She believed that her mistakes as a parent, as a mother, as a woman, as a human being, did not stop her from believing that she still was welcome to God's table. Because my mother was a joyous woman. And sometimes I would say to her, Ma, why are you smiling? And we don't know where we're gonna move. She's okay, we're gonna be all right. And I'm like, good Lord, how in the world why is she thinking like this? But then I, then I got it. Nobody was beating her anymore. She had a peaceful house. She wasn't moving every two years. Now she gave me that madness. Apparently I got to move every two years. But she, she found joy. In her imperfections, she still found joy. So this pericope that Jesus gave, that Jesus prayed to God, makes it okay to care and love for others, makes it okay to pray to God for support and assistance, makes it okay to, to have truths of love and, and, and forgiveness and inclusion, and it makes it okay to be connected to a God that brings about joy, amen.